We're just going to wait a couple more minutes for some more people to arrive. Um, so, in advance, I'd like to thank you for putting your phones away, your earbuds, not even hanging off your ear. All should be put away. Attention needs to be up here. We are extremely um, lucky to have Mr. Hashimoto here uh, to share his experience, his knowledge, and his history, which is our history. Um, not just as a community here in Salinas and Monterey County, but also, you know, as Americans. Um, this is, uh, those of you that have my class know that I've been referring to this as um, definitely one of the darkest um, blotches on our history, right up there uh, with slavery, uh, Jim Crow, and uh, the removal of Native Americans from their ancestral lands. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Mas Hashimoto. Saturday, I'm picking strawberries. You ever pick a strawberry? <laughs> yeah. You've learned everything you need to know about picking strawberries as soon as you pick one. It's a no-brainer. If it grew in the Parle Valley and Salinas Valley, I picked it. Okay? Uh, the hardest work that I had to do was that with this. You know what this is? Shorthand of hope. You know, they're planting the lettuce, they plant it all in a row. And what you do is you take out two plants, leave one so it can grow, take out two plants. And this is what you do for 85 cents an hour, 11 hours in a day. What do you do when you get to the end of the rope? You turn around and go back. Huh? You see this lettuce rope? Yeah. They're half a mile long. Every time I I see those farm workers out there, I say a little prayer for them. You got members of your family working out there? 
putting food on your table, on a nation's table. Hmm. It's honorable work. I'm, I'm very grateful to Cesar Chavez of the United Farm Workers because he had the legislature outlaw this. Today they use long handle hose and you develop a rhythm. I'm a farm worker. Paid for my college because I didn't get a scholarship. Graduated ninth in my class. There were only six scholarships and two were for agriculture. I was a soldier in the United States Army. After I finished college, got my teaching credential from San Jose State, I went to NPC first. I was assigned to the chemical section of 6th Army Headquarters at the Presidio San Francisco, the beautiful post. What did we do? Design, develop, chemical weapons, tear gas, pepper spray, and mustard gas. We got gas that make you vomit. We got nerve gases that kill you in 30 seconds. We have biological weapons. You know, flu, influenza can kill millions of people. In 1918, millions of people the world over died of the flu. We had a flu epidemic over here just recently. And then for 36 years, I got to teach. I to teach at Wasco High School, my old school. I was teaching with my teachers. That was fun. I kind of, the uh, first faculty meeting, I kind of sat back and I was trying to listen to the principal, but two guys behind me, two of my teachers, they, uh, they were laughing and joking. And I was wondering, what the hell is so funny? So I kind of leaned back and listened. And they didn't allow a Chinese American, Ernie Wong, who was ASB president of Watson High School and a member of the city council, to join the Elks Club. And they were laughing about not allowing a Chinese American to join. Elks Club discriminated against minorities and women. And I was wondering how many of my teachers are racist? No, I knew one, again, okay, when I was in school. And um, she never gave us anything higher than a C, Japanese Americans. That way we never qualified for national merit scholarships. Yeah. Anyway. I enjoyed my years of teaching. Okay, I had a lot of fun and had a lot of great friends who went on to do great and wonderful things. When I started teaching, I would ask the kids, okay, and pretend you're doing this, okay? Take out a piece of paper and draw an American for me. Okay? Simple task. Got somebody in mind? Mm -hmm. Draw an American. Okay, let me ask you guys this. How many of you thought of drawing a woman? Nobody? Hey, women are the majority in this country. There are more Americans who are women Women can do everything that a man can do. Who says it's a man's world? Men. What the hell is this? Women can do everything. You understand what I'm saying? Do everything a man can do and more. 
How many of you were thinking of a blonde, blue-eyed blue hunk of a guy? Thank you. Hitler would have been so proud. <laughs> you don't know what an American looks like? Draw me. Because I'm not Japanese. I've never been Japanese. My mother was Japanese. My father was Japanese. But I'm not Japanese. I'm an American. When I go to Japan and speak my Japanese, they laugh. They go, we don't talk like that anymore. <laughs> they know I'm a gaiji. In Japan, I'm a foreigner. When I was shopping in London, I had this nice conversation with a sales girl. And at the end, she says, oh, you Yanks. She looks at me. And I'm a Yank. But in parts of this country, I'm a damn Jap. There are parts in this country, Idaho, Montana, North Carolina, North Dakota, North Carolina too for that matter. It's not safe for me, especially if I have a California license plate. It was said of the Japanese in newspapers, the Japanese race is an alien race which could never be assimilated into the American way of life. There's nothing of value of Japanese culture. Mm. Nothing of value. Let me ask you guys this. How many of you guys can use chopsticks? How many of you, thank you. How many of you, you know, if you use a pencil, you could use chopsticks. Okay? It's that simple. And it's, uh, it's no fun going to a Japanese restaurant and, and, and using that little plastic fork. Okay, there's no adventure in that. The next time you go to a Japanese restaurant, yeah, you work with the chopsticks. Okay? Have fun with it. How many of you have eaten sushi? What? Sushi is good for you. <laughs> How many of you know what sashimi is? Oh, yeah. It's good. How many of you guys know what wasabi is? Yeah. yeah. I used to break out a little sweat, okay? I used to have a lot of hair on my head at one time. <laughs> How many of you guys know what teriyaki is? Yeah. All the major restaurants have teriyaki sandwich or something. Even, even Carl's Jr. As a teriyaki burger for crying out loud. <laughs> How many of you guys know what haiku is? Really? What is it? It's a poem. What, what's unique about the poem? How many? Three lines. How many syllables? Five, seven, five, seventeen. You know, anybody can write poetry, it's rhyme once in a while, but 17 syllables, three lines? That's a little challenge. My favorite is by a Zen monk. It doesn't translate into uh, 17 syllables, and I love it. The Bhagavashyo, Zen monk. The summer grasses. All that remains of a warrior's dream. The summer grasses, all that remains of a warrior's dream. It's a nonviolent anti war. <clears throat> I go to the cemetery. Arlington National Cemetery, Washington, D.C. I think. Yeah. Anyway, how many of you guys know what origami is? Yeah, there we go. Thank you. How many of you guys know what karate is? How many of you guys know what karate is? More hands go up. Okay. Kata is empty. Te is hand. Empty hand. Wax on, wax off, wax on. <laughs> that Marita. He was a friend. He died not too long ago. 
How many of you guys know what origami? I am. How many of you guys know what karaoke is? How many of you guys know what karaoke is? <laughs> Kata is empty. The Japanese took the word orchestra and, and shortened it. Empty orchestra. They're singing to a tape, right? And, you know, I'm a lousy singer, but I enjoy singing in the car by myself. I was at the stop, stoplight, and this car comes right next to me, and it's going boom, 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 boom. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and it was so loud, the vibration was so popular, my car started to boom, boom, shake a little bit. <laughs> and I started to laugh, you know why? I figured this, he's a lousier singer than me. He has to put on the music that loud. <laughs> Japanese culture, oh, bonsai, ikebana. They make a big ceremony out of drinking tea. But among all those, honor, loyalty, devotion, family, they're all important. You never bring shame to your family, to yourself, into your Japanese American community. Nothing of value of Japanese culture? Oh, come on, man. Give me a break. But I started to, to think. I was teaching U.S. history for three years, and I was just one page ahead of the kids. I didn't know about U.S. history. So I decided to buy a car, and travel throughout the south and up the east coast, midwest and such and come back. 90 days summertime. And a young friend from Stanford wanted to join me. So I said, yeah, I, I, I could use the company. We stopped in Dallas, Texas. I had to uh, have the car lubricated and the oil changed. And the gasoline price then was 25 cents a gallon. I drove into the station and you know, you didn't have to get out of the car. They checked your tire, your oil, you know, your, your oil. Your, they put gas in and cleaned the windshield. Four guys would surround the car and do that. And I saw these black kids. And I pulled out of the station. I said, no, no. I went to another station. There were black kids working there, too, high school age. And I, then it dawned on me. I'm looking for white kids to service my car. That's racism. I'm a racist. Yeah. My mother didn't raise me to be a racist. I didn't like me at all. I went into the next gasoline station, and I didn't care who was there servicing the car. Pulled in. I had to go to the potty. So I got out of the car. There's choices. Men, women, and colored. I went into the colored room. You have to knock with black uh, women and, and men knock on the door before they go in. But I came out, my car was serviced beautifully. When I, I didn't have a credit card, I paid everything in cash. I gave uh, the white guy the money and he threw the money, my change. He threw it on the ground because he saw me go into the colored restroom. In Mississippi, we decided to ride the bus. You remember Rosa Parks? No, ride the bus. We flipped the coin. He won the toss, so he's get, he gets to ride the bus, and I'm going to have to follow in the, in the car. And I went out in the back because uh, where the buses were because I, I wanted to know which one to follow because all the buses look, you know, alike. And then they called for the bus, and so uh, there were two waiting rooms, white and black. And the white people got on first, and my friend, a Japanese American, got on, and then uh, the blacks got on. 
and I saw this. The first three blacks in line were in their United States Air Force uniforms. They have to wait in line. They're in the service of the country. In New Orleans, in the nightclubs, blacks couldn't come in. They could be in the Dixieland and a jazz band and service the food and such, but they couldn't come in. Years later, I saw the Oakland Raiders uh, in the Super Bowl in New Orleans, and I saw black and white football players together going, going down Bourbon Street and into uh, the nightclubs and whatever together. And, yeah! Right on. This country has had a problem with racism. It still does. Hollywood movies. You know, in our day, we used to go to a movie once a week. Uh, and and we saw some great ones. How many of you have seen Gone with the Wind with Clark Gable? None of you? Oh, come on. You guys got to see these old classic movies. Yeah. How were black people portrayed in, in Hollywood movies in the old days? <laughs> Servants, you know, serving white masters. You know, United States Navy during World War II, if you were a member of the minority, you're in the war room in the kitchen serving white officers. You know, today we have Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman and other great actors. How are Hispanics portrayed in Hollywood movies? Banditos, you know, shoot them up, bang, bang, no regard for human life, uh, uh, dirty, lazy, manana. <laughs> how are they work beside Mexican-American kids in the field? And I know how hard they work and how honorable they are. You know, when Jennifer Lopez's movie comes on TV, I stop everything. I watch it. I don't care. <laughs> Nobody's fool. Asians. How are Asians portrayed in Hollywood movies? They're gangsters. You know, the exception of Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee, that movie. One of my students. Trying to make it in Hollywood, Johnny Nemoto. He has a nice, round, kind face. And he says, Mr. Ashimoto, the only roles out there are for Tibetan monks or gangsters. Mm -hmm. I said, John, you're going to have to write your own scripts, produce your own movies. That's why I love local film festivals, because they show films of real people. Anyway, one of the biggest agencies involved in discrimination is your United States government. Constitution, when it was written, it was written by rich people. Poor people couldn't be there. They couldn't spend three months in the summertime away from work. And when they wrote the Constitution, they wrote it for themselves to protect their life, liberty, and property. It's in the Constitution. Three-fifths. What's three-fifths? Anyone? Blacks were considered three-fifths of a white person for representation. The Constitution of the United States legalized slavery. <clears throat> Law of the land. Electing the president. This is this is the idea. Electing the president. We're going to let you poor people participate in this government. We're going to let you choose us, and then we electors will choose one of us to be president of the United States. Are we a democracy? No. We're a republic. If we had a democracy, somebody else would be president. 
she got three, almost three million more votes. We're not a democracy. We've never been. Did you ever hear the Trail of Tears? Cherokee Indians, right? 14,000 quarter of them were killed, died on the trail to Oklahoma, ordered by the President of the United States. Alien Act, Alien Sedition Act, the Enemies Act. Their acts against Italians, Irish Catholics. <laughs> the Irish Catholics came over here in large numbers because of famine in their country. But they didn't go, go to uh, Midwest, Kansas, Nebraska, and such. They stayed in the cities. What city is known as Little Dublin? Boston, with the Kennedys and Fitzgeralds and others. In New York, there were the Irish cops in musicals like West Side Story and Guys and Dolls, Irish cops. It's on the muscles of the Irish that industrial America was built. They worked in the mines and the steel mills and railroads, the factories. They built industrial America. And then there was a recession where a lot of people were unemployed. And they put a big sign there, no Irish need apply. Because they were Catholics. Some people kept the signs turn around, use the backside, no jabs allowed. This country has had a problem with racism. All three branches of the government practice racism. And part of that racial hatred, racial prejudice, involved me. You have a little tag like this? This is my prison number, 12524. That was for the family on the letter D. I was a prisoner of war during World War II. Out on my own country. No charges, no attorney, no trial, no due process of law. So what happened? Yeah. My first prison was just a, probably a less than a mile away from here. Liberty lost lessons in loyalty. We lost our liberty. Lessons in loyalty had two parts to it. One, we were loyal to this country, and there were people who were loyal to us, who helped us, Caucasian, Chinese, and others. And they're called jack lovers for helping us. See this? What's running through the flag? Barbed wire. Could we have the, perhaps the, some of the lights? And, uh, the Japanese in the Monterey region uh, by Sandy Lydon, he's an instructor at Cabrillo College. And he wrote, well, about one third of the Japanese that came here went back to Japan. And um, the Japanese had a lot to do with improving agriculture in California. But it wasn't just the Japanese, the Chinese, the Filipinos, the Mexicans, the Italians, the Croatians, and others did it too. This is the Wada family. They went back to Japan. American farmer, Jap says a derogatory term, it's like uh, the N word. Hindus not wanted anti-alien association. There are many groups that were anti-alien, anti-immigrants. Um, daughters of the American Revolution, native sons of the Golden West, thank you. Um, they were patriotic organizations, but they were anti-minorities. You had to be white, of the white race, Anglo, Anglo Saxon Protestant. Anglo refers to England, Saxon Germany. And Protestant comes from the word protest, a protestant. 
to someone protesting protesting views of the Catholic Church. Segregated schools. Now you think of the South between the blacks and the whites, but we had them right here in California. Uh, the school district, elementary school district, provided a teacher. The Japanese community provided a building. And the teacher taught from kindergarten to eighth grade in one classroom. This is my family. My father, he was born in 1877 in Fukuoka, Japan. He and his first wife went to Hawaii to work in 1899. The work was so hard, his first wife divorced him and went back to Japan. Working in the sugar plantation was, was so difficult. He left Honolulu for San Francisco because he had heard that the wages were better. And so he, he left on the ship SS Alameda on April 18, 1906. You know what happened in San Francisco that day? Earthquake. So he probably didn't land in San Francisco. He probably landed in Oakland. My mother had an unhappy marriage. She was divorced, and she willingly became a picture bride. And she came here in 1914. She was 21 years of age. She married my father on the day that she got off the boat and saw him for the first time. There's seven sons in the family, all boys. Brother number one. One and two, two is missing. Now there was talk about rounding up all the Japs and sending them back to Japan. My father, not taking any chances, sent one and two to Japan for their education. Number one was given to grandparents. But the grandparents died, he was pretty much on his own. He was resourceful, resourceful. But he was going to get drafted in 1937 into the Japanese Imperial Army, and he saw what the Japanese Army was doing to China. He didn't want any part of that, so he borrowed money from relatives and friends and got back here. He's a draft dodger, but of the Japanese Army. Brother number two was given to an uncle who had no children. That's not an uncommon practice. Brother number two fought and died for the Japanese. Brothers number three and four, they graduated from Watson High School class of 1938-1940. You know, each day after school, they, in high school, they, they were going to Japanese school. They could read and write Japanese. So when the war began, and the military was looking for linguists, they volunteered to serve in what's known as the Military Intelligence Service. We use the Japanese language as a weapon against the Japanese. Today, that school, Military Intelligence Service, is at the Presidio of Monterey. And it's known as the Defense Language Institute. Monterey is the capital, language capital of the world. Hmm? Noriyuki, brother number five, he was 14 years of age. He'll be killed, right? About a mile from here. And I'll explain that a little later. Mitz, he graduated from Watson High School in 1950. Korean War started in 1950. He volunteered to serve in the United States Navy as a corpsman medic. That chubby little kid, that's me. <laughs> I know, so cute. <laughs> that hair. <laughs> My father died soon after this picture was taken. He died before I was three years old. My mother had to take care of the family. We became farm workers. The restaurant business closed and we became farm workers. The FBI came into our homes looking for incriminating evidence. We had to turn it in. All cameras, all weapons, guns, samurai swords if we had them, all radios, all flashlights, Father could be arrested at his place of work. They knew where we were because the Bureau of the Census gave all that information to the FBI. Now, 
Jack Monsoka was a sophomore in high school, and he uh, he drew what was happening. And these drawings become tremendously historically important. And the FBI officers say, well, what about this postcard from Japan? Oh, how we all have postcards from relatives in Japan. The family heirlooms, some of them will be destroyed in the fireplace or in the bonfire uh, in the backyard. Mr. Kizuka, he was the leader of the Japanese Christian Church. All the leaders were rounded up, whether they, if they were language instructors or judo instructors, Buddhist ministers, and sent to a camp in North Dakota. His son, who was 17 years old, had to take care of grandma, mother, kid sister, kid brother. Had to close up the farm and the house. He hadn't even graduated. The newspapers clamored for our removal, especially the Examiner and the Hearst papers. General DeWitt said, a Jap's a Jap. It doesn't make any difference whether he's a citizen or not. He can't be trusted. He had the ear of the President of the United States. Now, that was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI said, Mr. President, We've been studying the Japanese community for years. There's nothing going on. We don't need to do this. Francis Biddle, who was the Attorney General for the United States, said, Mr. President, I don't think we can do this. We have a constitution. Didn't matter. 120,000 of us will go to prison. These are three of my heroes. Gordon Hiroshi, Min Yasui, and Fred Komatsu. I don't know whether your textbook covers Fred Komatsu case at all. But these guys protested, went to prison, tried and convicted. And in this case, Fred Komatsu's case, the Supreme Court Rule 63 that yes, you can imprison anyone under military necessity. Today the term would be uh, national security. Yes. You can forget the Constitution Bill of Rights. The next time, I suspect it will be reporters of the real news. It doesn't have to be an ethnic group. It doesn't have to be Muslims or any other group. Japan towns, yeah. Set, you know, Salinas has a Japan town. It's uh, right next to Chinatown, right? Okay, there's a Buddhist temple there too. Well, there's only three left in the state of California out of 43. That's San Francisco, San Jose, and Los Angeles. All those of Japanese ancestry were to be uh, report were, were to report for uh, indoctrination. Uh, incarceration. And here, all those of Japanese ancestry, it says aliens and non-aliens. Well, my mother's an alien, and she can't be a citizen of the United States if it's against the law. She's an enemy alien. Who's a non-alien? Me? I was born in this country. I'm a United States citizen. But they didn't put down the United States citizen, they put non-alien. You're born here, you're a non-alien. Evacuation, yeah, sales, 10 cents on a dollar if you can get that. Some of the guys that bought brand new tractors for their farm, they were just coming out of the depression, and they're so happy they bought cars and, and tractors and such, and all of that will be taken away. Cartoons about Buck teeth, slant eyes, and glasses. Uh, hideous, once, you know, hideous Japanese face would be placed on the body of a rat or gorilla. You know, they did that to Barack Obama when he became president of the United States. They put his face on the body of a gorilla. And we said, stop it! They did. Japanese, Chinese, this Tojo, earthly yellow complexion. 
This is from Life magazine, which was a popular magazine at that time. Parchment, yellow complexion, Chinese. See anything funny about that? What the heck is earthly yellow? Well, parchment, this is black and white. <laughs> you guys have computers and you print pictures. You see the computer, oh, that, that's the picture. I, I want coloring and everything. And then when you print it, it comes out a little different. <laughs> Sometimes rosy cheek, the poor Chinese never has rosy cheek. This is so stupid. The cartoonist wanted to help. He drew about East Asia. Here's a Caucasian. Here's a Chinese who are allies of the United States. And here's the short, all-legged guy, the Japanese. Chinese face, ooh, look at that mean sucker. <laughs> Japanese, he's got a more massive jaw, and he's got more fur on his body. He's got more hair. He's more primitive. If that's the case, I must be Chinese. <laughs> I don't know. <even> <laughs> In a crowd, you can always pick out a Chinese from a Japanese because a Chinese walks like a white guy, Caucasian, whereas a Japanese shuffles his feet. Asians have long torsos and short legs. You know what that means? It's hard for them to become Miss Universe. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> have them take off their shoes and socks, and if they're big feet, the big toe is separate from the other toes, and they've got to be Japanese because Japanese wear sodis, or what you girls call flip-flops. Which means if you keep wearing flip-flops, you're going to start looking more Japanese again. <laughs> if you had one sixteenth Japanese blood, Asians could not marry whites. It was against the law. Asians could not become citizens of the United States. Asians could not own property. They didn't want us here. We didn't have anybody with one sixteenth Japanese, but that's five generations. We only had three. Uh, soldiers. Some of the soldiers were very nice. They had, uh, had candy for the kids while we were waiting for the bus to take us to our first prison. There was one way, I forgot, there's one way in which a Japanese immigrant could become a citizen of the United States, and that was if he fought in World War I in the United States military. This guy proved his loyalty to the United States. He became a citizen of the United States. He says, I don't have to go. And they say, yes, you do. And by the way, we're taking your citizenship away. Stanley Shigo drew this 12-year-old girl in Los Angeles, in Hollywood, actually. And uh, she didn't want to leave her home and her classmates. She cried and cried. She suffered a heart attack and she died in that church, part of the church. You don't have to be old to have a heart attack. Go girl with the apple, she becomes our poster girl. You can take, okay, two suitcases and the two suitcases, you notice, didn't have any wheels. What's in here? Bedding, but no mattress. Kitako Izumizaki, she had just graduated from Watson High School. And uh, she said, oh, Mr. Ashimoto, it was easy to pack. Oh, really? Uh, how so? She said, I only had three dresses. One for school, one for Sunday school, one for work. I took my favorite book of poetry, a dictionary, other kid articles, and I'm going, yeah, that's, on, that's not even half of one suitcase. What else did you take? She said, the rest of that suitcase and the other suitcase, I filled it with sanitary napkins because I figured the army wasn't going to provide, and she was right. They didn't. The other girls had to make good with whatever they could find. With Okay, Even babies had tags too. We had a lot of young mothers. And what are they going to take? Baby clothes, diapers, and baby food, maybe a toy. You know, the diapers in those days were made of cotton, a 
and you wash them. There's not, none of that flush of eye thing. She just recently died <coughs> in Seattle. She was 104 years old. You know what that means? Sushi is good for you. <laughs> Pay attention. I'm just joking. Okay. I had a little dog like this. We boarded up our house in Watsonville, and uh, we had brand new refrigerator stove. We gave that to our friends. They could use it during the war. Uh, Stacy Irwin, she was an attorney, and uh, I gave my dog to her. I bought the dog here in Salinas. I traded it for canaries. We raised canaries. She wrote to us saying that the dog wasn't eating very well and she was afraid the dog would die. And so she asked if the dog could be sent. And she sent it to us to post in Arizona across the Colorado River. Question, how do you send a dog to post it from Watson? Greyhound bus. <laughs> Greyhound. The drivers were very nice. They made sure she had food and water. And I had the only dog for a while there. The only dog for 18,000 people. Uh, she was so cute. She went to everybody. She did. She was so friendly. You know, dogs are like that. You know. You remember Katrina, um, Hurricane, in New Orleans? Uh, people didn't want to be rescued if their dogs or pets couldn't be rescued too. Pets are important. Oh, yeah. They're part of the family. You know, when they create about dogs, they're colorblind. I wish humans were colorblind. One day the dog disappeared. And I had the whole family and friends looking for her. After three days, I had given up because I figured coyotes must have eaten her. But then she miraculously reappeared out. Oh, man, I was the happiest eight-year-old. She was my best friend growing up. She waited for me to get home from school. Yeah, I brought her home. We'd go for a walk after school every day. She listened to my speeches that I had to give the next day. She was my foot warmer in bed. She died when I was a junior in high school. My junior year hurt. Dogs important? Oh, yeah. Cub Scout, 10 years old, he had his glove, ball, and the soldiers said, hey, kid, give me that bat. It could be a weapon. And his bat was taken away from him. True story. It really happened to this guy, Norman Manetta. He was 10 years old then. Don't feel sorry for him, okay, because he has a bat signed by Hank Aaron <laughs> and Stella Harrell, the Japanese owner of the Anyway. This is one of those before and after where we were gone. One third of the graduating class of Boston High School were Japanese Americans. We didn't get to graduate. They didn't get to graduate with their, with their classmates. My best friend in kindergarten and first grade was Tony Hernandez. Because we're the two smallest kids. He welcomed me back in the fifth grade. He asked, well, where'd you, where'd you, what happened? Where'd you go? And I told him what had happened. And we went through high school together and such. I stayed small. He grew to six feet. And Santa Anita Racetrack was the first prison for the Los Angeles people. The one family wants to find out if the horse stall they were in was used by Sea Biscuit. Tamperan Racetrack in San Bruno. It's not there anymore. Okay? It's a shopping center. But the girls cried to sleep each night because of the stench of manure and urine. And you could hear what's being said in, because the open the ceiling was open. Some of 
you guys have to go. Yeah, so we're just going to take a couple minute break. Um, my third period class is coming. If you're with Mr. Osama, um, where you need to go uh, to the third period, Okay, so those of you that are staying, just sit tight, maybe stretch your legs for a couple minutes. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, those of you that are just joining us, you may have got a little tag, um, and it's been spoken about just a, just a skosh, uh, but these are the tags that um, all of the Japanese Americans or um, all those being arrested would be given with their name, number, and the location of their camp. Um, so you're just coming in a little bit into Mr. Hashimoto's talk, um, and so he's going to leave off where he came from, which is after um, being rounded up in the process of how the local community here and all across the western seaboard uh, were going about collecting those of Japanese ancestry to arrest them and send them to these camps. So, so thanks for coming. Um, if you could turn your phones on silent, lose the earbuds, even hanging off your ear, that'd be great. And um, thank you for your patience. Thank you. Okay, part two. I, I, have to, uh, I have to tell you this, okay? There's 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans living in the states of Washington, Oregon, and California on the western coast. We go to prison for about three, three years, three and a half years. There's 158,000, that's more, huh? 158,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans living in the territory of Hawaii. It wasn't a state yet. And with the exception of about 1,400 of their leaders, they didn't go to prison. Isn't that amazing? They're in the war zone, right? They don't go to prison. We're 2,500 miles away, and we go to prison. What was the difference? Racial prejudice. in Washington, Oregon, California, but not so in Hawaii. You know, when you go to Hawaii, how many of you have been to Hawaii? It's a great place. It's friendly. Okay? It's pretty friendly. And just naval intelligence and the FBI in Hawaii said, it's not necessary. Nothing is happening. And the larger single group were Japanese and Japanese Americans. See, the census was taken in 1940. So they knew where we were all located. Well, in Hawaii, 37%, that was the largest single group of plurality. They needed the Japanese and Japanese Americans to run the economy of Hawaii to uh, repair the gun, ship, tanks, and so forth. You know, Disney made a movie, uh, and um, we got the script, our organization, the Japanese American Citizens League, and um, we, we suggested some changes, but Disney didn't uh, do that. In the movie, there's one and one half Japanese in the movie. There's virtually no Hawaiian. The Hawaiians didn't like it because they were left out of the movie. It was strictly a white man's movie. And uh, Disney lost some money on that. Even even those who participated in the, you know, the, were there at Pearl Harbor during the Japanese attack. They didn't like the movie. Uh, you have to be somewhat historical. Accurate. Anyway, so we go to prison. We live in uh, 
Washington, Oregon, California, and, and uh, this scene here is of uh, Canfarin Racetrack. Um, and it was horrible, it was miserable uh, for the people living there. Now, we were uh, a little luckier in this area because the Monterey, Salinas, Hollister, Gilroy, Santa Cruz, Watsonville people, we went to the Rodeo Grounds, just south of here, about 3,600 plus. This is the Rodeo Grounds in 1942. Now, the horse stalls are here, but we didn't stay in them. We were lucky. We stayed in these buildings. These barracks will be used by Filipino troops after we meet for basic training. Now, there's a baseball field here and a softball field here, but we weren't allowed to use them. Uh, that was reserved for the Salinas schools. And your school is up here, right? Okay, this is the grandstand. My brother was playing baseball and um, he hit the ball and he ran and he hit the ball and the first baseman collided. And my brother's skull was crushed at the temple and the flow of blood stopped in his brain and he died three hours later. He was complaining of headache. He was hiding underneath one of the barracks because he didn't want to tell mom that he was hurting. He died. He was 14 years old. It was an accident, okay? It was nobody's fault. I mean, it's not the government's fault. It was an accident. So we had his funeral. We uh, cremated his body, left the ashes in a mortuary here in Salinas. And one of the first things we did when we got back in 1945, come over here to Salinas, pick up my brother's ashes, and bring him home for burial. Salinas so School is a Washington middle school. <coughs> they sent us books and, and magazines. That was really nice. While we were there in this camp for three, uh, three months. We're supposed to stay away from the fence, okay, there's a 10 feet. And if you cross that, you could be shot. And not in Salinas, but one of the other camps. One old man who was hard of hearing and he didn't understand English, he was shot in the back because he was on the line. The guard shot and killed eight and wounded 20 others in the three and a half years we were in prison. There's the story of Ralph Lasso, who was a Mexican American kid in Los Angeles, who uh, he was a junior in high school. And his Japanese American buddies were uh, forced to go to Manzanar, and uh, he was to see them off, and then he jumped on the train and went to Manzanar, and he says, who says I don't have Japanese blood? He didn't. He had Mexican and Irish blood. <laughs> When he was old enough, he volunteered for the United States military army. And because his Japanese was so good, he got Japanese soldiers to surrender in the Pacific War. Ralph Lazo. Ralph Lazo, truly a hero. He later became, after the war, he became a teacher in the Los Angeles Unified School District. And a few years ago, Ralph Lazo passed away. When we were gone, there was a shortage of labor. Who's going to harvest the crops? So, the labor camps will be built. The U.S. government asked the Mexican government to bring up guest workers to harvest the crops. It was called the Bacero Program. I think most of you have heard of that program. We stood in line for breakfast and lunch and dinner, and it was boring. We had outhouses. When the Filipino troops came and they saw out of there, no, no way. They wanted flush toilets. They got flush toilets. What is she doing? Men and women use the same toilet. 
So, we rigged up a signal. When the dinner bell rang for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, the guys would go to eat and the girls would go to the potty. After the meals switch. The holes were so big, one kid from Hollister fell in. Poor kid. He was called Stinky after that. Poor kid. There was talk about taking us out to the desert and exterminating us. And when we got on the train, going to a postman, and it was getting hotter and hotter and hotter, some people were convinced that we were going to be exterminated. Watson High School sent our girls some softball equipment. That was nice. Softball's here. Here's the back. Some friends came to uh, visit us. Many of them were school teachers. And uh, they incurred, they wrote letters of recommendation to get our, our graduates into uh, colleges and universities in the Midwest and on the East Coast. The reward for helping us is they would have their tires slashed or the windshields uh, broken. Windshields could be replaced, but the tires, oh. You'd see the speed limit during World War II in the whole country was 35 miles an hour. Not to save gasoline, we had plenty of gasoline, but to save rubber tires. Anything that came from the tropics, you know, bananas, pineapple, coffee, tea, rubber, tins, whatever came from the tropics was hard to get. You had to register your family for size, number, ages, and then you got a ration book, and you could buy butter, meat, uh, potatoes, and so forth, uh, depending upon your ration book. Um, fish was not rationed. You could buy as much fish as you wanted. So the Monterey canneries were going big time. Graduating class of Watsonville High School. There's 30 of them here. 47 should have been. 17 others went to other camps. They didn't get a graduation ceremony. They, they, some of them got their, uh, here they got their uh, diplomas, but not a cap and gown ceremony. So Watsonville High School in 1992, 50 years later, to the exact hour, these kids, now 68 years old and grandparents, got their diplomas and their cap and gown ceremony. They graduated with the class of 1990, first in the nation to do this. University of, Berk uh, University of California, Berkeley said, what a great idea. And they didn't want to wait a whole year, so immediately they looked into the record books and found as many as they could that would have graduated in 1942 called them in September and they had a ceremony. That we, we loaded up onto the trains okay, to go to Post in Arizona. It didn't make any difference how sick you were, you had to go. The soldiers saw us off, okay? On the, the last group, they, they were from San Juan Batista. The last group pulled out on the 4th of July. That's when the camp. Salinas Assembly Center closed. These soldiers turned around and marched in a parade in uh, Salinas. Kid is wearing his favorite t-shirt, Superman. Superman's been around a long time. So we went from cool, foggy Monterey Bay to Post in Arizona. It was 120 degrees when we got off the train. It was so hot, half the group had heat stroke. They gave us uh, salt tablets and water to drink. The water was rust colored. And the salt tablet, if you took it right away, you threw up. So you learn to dissolve the salt in your mouth first, little by little, and drink a little water with it. What's interesting about Poston and Gila River near Phoenix is that we were on an Indian reservation. The Indians did not want us. Why? They didn't want what happened to them happened to us. Um, happened to them, okay, happened to us. But today we're working with the Native uh, Americans. Uh, we meet all the time, uh, planning uh, reunions and such. 
There are two in California. Manzanar is the most famous. How many of you read Farewell to Manzanar? One. Just one? Yeah. Jeannie Walkotsky Houston. She lives here in Santa Cruz. And she's a dear friend. This is the most famous. Tule Lake was, will become the largest. Minidoka, Art Mountain, Topaz, Granada, or Amachi, and then two in Arkansas, the swamp area of Arkansas Roar. On the back side of your tags, okay, are the names of the uh, uh, camps. Actually, there were 69 different installations in which Japanese, Japanese Americans were in prison. The 10 major camps in there. This must be the bunch from the Bay Area. The low guy Fresno people could take the heat, but the Monterey people, oh no, that's hard. This is going to be my home for the next three years, three months. Four families in one, one barrack. There's four rooms. There's one light bulb in each room. It's covered by black tar paper. So you can imagine it was hotter inside than it was outside. It was like being in an oven. These two barracks put together, that's uh, the mess hall. That's where we ate. The laundry room. Men's toilet and shower, women's toilet and shower. These have running water. Now there's 14 barracks in a block. About 250 to 280 people will live in one uh, block. Uh, I was in 12A. If I had to go to the potty at night, I had to go here. These two barracks were for uh, couples, or for singles, okay. Uh, so there were uh, just enough room for two cots. Ah, mattress cover. They gave us mattress covers and then they said, uh, stuff the mattress with straw, but be careful of the scorpions that are uh, hiding in the straw. Mom slept in one corner, okay, the boys in another. If I had sisters, they'd be in the other other corner. The, the wood was laid green and so in the heat it shrank and dust would come up through the, the floor. The knot holes would pop out and so you know those uh, tuna can, the lids, and, okay, we would place them over there. And the top was open so you could hear what's being said in the next room, what the next family is saying. So privacy, yeah, virtually non-existent. If you had 116 Japanese blood, you were brought to Manzanar. If you were an orphan or lived in a foster home, you were brought to Manzanar. These children posed no threat to national security, but they hated us so much. Dust storms and sandstorms, yet they're not the same. Dust storms, wow, they go hundreds of feet high and they, they can move, you know, right over. I saw a dust storm over Phoenix and I felt sorry for those people. You know, they're, they're swimming pools and everything, all that sand and dust in it. The sandstorms, oh man, they would hurt. It's like being in a sand blaster. And uh, you fought, you know, you sought shelter wherever you could. You know, you go into somebody's uh, room to get out of the dust storm. So we ate dust. You know, you wash your clothes and the dust storm comes and you have to wash it again. The Beckus family of Watsonville visited the Yagi family. And um, they wrote in their entry, they, they kept the wrong, and they said that the dinner meal in the barracks, uh, in, in our block, was ruined by a dust storm. And the entry was December 25th, 1942. Ah, we did have flush toilets. But, <laughs> you had to check for black little spiders before you sat down. You're allowed eight squares of toilet tissue a day, that was the only ration. And we had diarrhea problems and food poisoning and such. And eight wasn't enough. What's missing? in this photo. See? The stalls. The girls hated to go to the restroom or the showers. Okay? Privacy virtually non-existent. Read across from another family. So you're not going to have family discussions at dinner time. And the family began to break up. 
Basically, the Japanese uh, families were patriarchal. We're going to become more matriarchal. Father had no control of what was happening. He lost his masculinity. Ah, rather safe. They left the shade underneath our barracks, and that's where we wanted to sleep in the summertime. So we would fight them for this. Well, we would catch them, kill them, skin them, cook them, and eat them. How many have eaten rattlesnake? Pretty good, huh? Is that the uh, chicken? No, chicken bread. You, know, you put teriyaki sauce on it. <laughs> Scorpions, if you lived in Arizona, the place, you, every morning you check your shoes or uh, little scorpions, okay? They, they love the moisture uh, in the shoes and such, so you, you check for that. And the bigger ones, you tie a thread around them, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, with a little stick too. And then you, you'd have your pet for the day. <laughs> and you take them to school, the teachers would uh, scream. Blankets and, and bedspreads become walls. Next time, I would take vegetable seeds, garden hose, bucket, okay, uh, hammer, uh, screwdriver, and nails. Uh, th th those would be important. Because uh, if you had carpenter skills, you could make benches and so I had a little stool that I used to go to school. <coughs> and I would sit on this little canvas stool and say, okay, teacher, teach. Dr. Ito, he was a dentist. Now, we got paid for the work we did. And no one was supposed to make more than a soldier in the United States Army. A private made $21 when he was a recruit. Later, the pay for the privates went up to $50 a month. But ours stayed the same. $19 for professional people. My mother was an assistant cook. She worked 10 hours a day for $16 a month. That means she worked for five cents an hour. The lowest pay was $12 a month. Question, why did we need the money? Now the food was provided. But, good thinking. You see, I know, oh, for the first group, I, I told this, we boarded up our house, right? And gave the keys to a trusted friend. We have to pay taxes on our house to the county of Santa Cruz and to the city of Watsonville. Otherwise, we would lose the house before closure. So we needed the money. My brothers who were in the army, they sent half a paycheck back to mom so that she could pay the taxes. Soldiers got the medicine first, other second we were last. Babies died. My oldest brother who would have made, who would have made a great soldier because of his skills, language skills, he got tuberculosis in camp, one of 153 posted alone. He couldn't serve. He was sent to a sanitarium. We brought water in from the Colorado River. It was only three miles away. We dug a big ditch, brought the water in, and we planted little gardens. But we also did one more thing. The desert boomed with water. We grew over 40 different kinds of vegetables. We sent vegetables to the other camps. We had our own chicken farm, our own pig farm, our own police department, fire department. We showed the Indians how to farm the land. Now the Indians, in their culture, the warrior hunts and protects. On a reservation, the army does the protecting, the Bureau of Indian Affairs provides the food, nothing for him to do. Women do everything else. And when it comes to farming, women do it. If a warrior takes up that job, he becomes a squaw man, and that's a put down. And we're saying, no, farming is honorable work. And today they are farming the land successfully. They're growing peanuts, clover, cover crops, cotton, and such. 
And we meet with them regularly. <laughs> you know what's funny? They're making more money with their casino and hotel. <laughs> but they're still farming. Okay. We had our own uh, county uh, fair on who could grow the best vegetables. Baseball. The Japanese love baseball. You know, at a high school championship game in Japan, 60,000 people would be in the stands. You ever heard of uh, Ichiro Suzuki? Mariners? Oh, I don't know what they're explaining from Mariners. And Japanese love baseball. Our family, baseball wasn't uh, particularly. Even my brother was killed, remember? All you need is a rim and a ball, and all you can make the rest. These guys had fancy uniforms. My uniform was made from discarded mattress cover. I was happy. Toys R Us. Our adults made toys. In fact, we had a toy library. You could check out a toy, play with it, and bring it back. If you broke it, that's okay. That's okay. Somebody will fix it. What a great idea, a toy library. Flower ranging. There's one problem with flower ranging in the desert. <laughs> no flowers. So they made them out of paper. We made things out of paper, iron wood, part of a tree, scrap wood. These are made out of seashells. Sierra Nevada, the okay, mountains, Cascade Mountains, there's once ocean floor. You go to Topaz, Utah, that's the desert. We find seashells. Why? Because at one time, millions of years ago, it was a sea floor. <clears throat> Little clam, baby clam shells, made into a what? A chameleon? Our, our people are very talented. A piece of wood. Scrap wood. We had a 4th of July parade, and led by the Boy Scouts. Okay? When I learned the flag salute, you guys, this is the way I learned it. Okay, in kindergarten. My hands are down. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. This is the way you get used to it. To the flag of the United States of America. And in the war, during the war, we change from this to this over the heart. How come? Too close. Uh, Hitler. And from a distance, you couldn't tell whether the palm was up or down. So we changed to this over the heart. This teacher is looking up because the last words of the Pledge of Allegiance is with liberty and what? Justice for all except us. Who is this? Santa Claus and Christmas tree. And Children all over the country sent our children presents. That was really nice. You know, one of the toys for tots kind of thing. The present itself wasn't that important. We were remembered. Buy Christmas seals to fight tuberculosis. That's me. Our adults made little benches for the children for kindergarten. This is in the laundry room. We didn't have books, paper, pencils, and such. We didn't even have a qualified teacher, just a volunteer. Finally, California sent us some books, for which we were grateful. I know this is in the wintertime, but she's wearing a bandana. We're finally allowed to have cameras and a yearbook. And in the last year that we were there, the El Chaparral, the editor of the El Chaparral, senior in high school, was Pete Hironaka of Salinas. He still had faith in this. This is the preamble to what? To what? Constitution. These guys still believed in the Constitution in the United States. The prison pictures. Class of 1945. They're from Salinas and Watsonville, Lodi, San Diego, Stockton. She's still alive. I don't know about the others. I'm in the fourth grade. I'm in the front row. 
and see if you can pick me out. Okay? Now look carefully and don't say we all look alike. <laughs> That one. This is a girl. What are you talking about? <laughs> How many of you, okay, knew that that was me? Raise your hand. Very good. See, you guys can recognize intelligence and leadership, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what the heck is he doing? <laughs> General Harold McLean, he was the principal son, they were from Hawaii. He was so nice. Miss Cooper, she was a Quaker from Pennsylvania. The only organization nationwide that supported us were the Quakers, American Friends. ACLU did not. All those Civil rights organizations, no, they're afraid to. Uh, freedom is just on the other side. This is Sierra Nevada Mountain. But, uh, you know what they're looking at? Death Valley. <laughs> we had 5,000 Japanese American soldiers in the United States Army when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Did you know that? We had the draft. Their guns were taken away and given mops and digging latrines and whatever. But we wanted to fight in this war. We wanted to do our part. We wanted to prove our loyalty. And so the 142nd Regimental Combat Team will be organized. The most decorated unit for size and length of service in military history. They're known as the Purple Heart Battalion. Thousands volunteered from Hawaii. There's a question of loyalty. Will you fight for the United States? All those 17 years of Asian over were asked. 28 questions. 27 and 28 were the important ones. 27 and 28. They asked three questions but wanted two answers. My mother said, yes, she'll fight for the United States. She knew, she's 50 something years old. She, not, she knows that she's not going to be drafted into the United States Army. The second question, number 28, had two parts. Will you swear allegiance to the United States and forswear any allegiance to the Emperor of Japan? And a lot of guys protested. They said, we've never had any allegiance to the Emperor of Japan. My mother said, yes, on that one too. By saying yes, she gave up her, her Japanese citizenship. She was now a stateless person, but she figured, eh, eh, Japan's never going to know. And she was right. She told us, we're going to go, yes, yes, we'll fight for this country. Now, there were people in Canada who were pro-Japan, who wanted Japan to win the war. They went after my oldest brother, the one that you know was educated in Japan, draft doctor of the Japanese army, and got tuberculosis. Well, before he got tuberculosis, they went after him. They wanted him to join their group. Nope. We're going to be pro-America. These guys said, no, we'll not fight for the United States unless I qualified him. Unless you release our families and restore our constitutional rights. They were tried and convicted and went to prison. President Harry Truman, after the war, pardoned all of them. Many of these guys fought in the Korean War. They were not cowards. They were standing up for their constitutional rights. Every camp had an honor roll. General Mark Clark. He says, okay, if General Eisenhower and General Patton do not want Japanese American soldiers, I'll take them. And they fought so well, he said, send me more. These two mothers had four children in the military of the United States. If one is killed, 
then one of the stars becomes a gold star and should be known as a gold star mother. The Army came up with this batch. The Army uh, uh, War Department did. A yellow arm and a bloody dagger, and the guys hated it. It's so racist. And so they had a contest, and Michi Mamoto of Watsonville came up with this. What is this? Statue of Liberty, the arm of Statue of Liberty. This is what we'll fight for. My friend who is uh, Senator Daniel K. Inoue of Hawaii, he says, boss, see the shape? It's the shape of a coffin. And a lot of guys died wearing it. In one particular battle in France, an a Texas battalion went too far and got cut off by the Germans. And two battalions of Texans couldn't rescue them. And so they asked the 442nd to go and rescue them. And they did. It took them four days. It was uh, November, uh, end of October, beginning of November. It was cold. It was wet. Miserable. And the guys did. They rescued 211 Texans. All that remained of that Texas battalion. 184 Japanese Americans were killed, rescued 211, and over 600 were badly wounded. Was it worth it? Oh yeah. You always go after your buddies. You don't leave them out there. These are the Texans. Guys were patched up, wounded, okay, patched up, they went back in the back. This is what you get if you are wounded, or if you're killed, your family gets it. What is this? Purple Heart, thank you. That's the Infantry Rifleman's badge. The General Dockwood said, I want to thank the 442nd, please have them assembled. And he saw the group, he says, I want them all here. And the Colonel says, sir, that's all that's left of the 442nd. One company of 150, only eight guys could muster. Another 12, another 20. Henry Zumizaki was one of the 184 killed. This was Watsonville. His older brother was in the same unit, visited the gravesite in France. But the mother, who had four sons in the military. Yeah. Henry was the one that was killed. One of the body brought back home in 1948. He was brought back home. And Henry's buried in his beloved father's house. Harry Montecoro was my neighbor. His father died, his sister died, it was just Harry and himself. He didn't have to fight in this war. You guys. Have you guys seen this movie called Saving Private Ryan? See, if you're the sole surviving son, you didn't have to fight in this war. A lot of guys in Salinas didn't fight in the war because they were the sons of farmers. Farming important in the war effort? Oh, yeah. Just as much as fighting in the front? Well, Harry didn't have to fight in this war. But he got others to volunteer. He was killed. We had his funeral in camp. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. There's only one higher Congressional Medal of Honor. His mother is wearing his medal. She has her Bible in hand. And this picture always hurts. She gave her one and only son to this country. And she cannot be a citizen of the United States. She went back to Japan after the war, where she had some relatives and she died there. The law was finally changed in 1952, where our Issei immigrant parents could become citizens of the United States. And they were out. He worked here in Santa Salinas. I put his medals in a case for him. He, too, 
got the Distinguished Service Cross. You have to get four of these, his campaign medals. He said, Moss, I saw the Statue of Liberty when I left. I saw the Statue of Liberty when I came back. A lot of guys didn't come back. Every time I'm at the Statue of Liberty, I think of Henry and I. I think of all those guys that didn't come back. Shiv Kizuka, his father was arrested. He was a leader of the Watsubo Japanese Christian Church. At night, they climbed a 3,000 foot mountain and surprised the Germans on the Gotha line. The U.S. Army couldn't move past the Gotha line for five months. The Japanese Americans did it in 32 minutes. Japanese Americans opened up Dachau concentration camp. Their families were in a concentration camp in this country. Let me ask you guys this. How many were killed by the Nazis in those death camps, the Holocaust? 11 million, thank you. Of which nearly 6 million were Jews. There were Americans killed. There were Mexicans killed. Young students who were studying in Berlin couldn't get back. They were trapped. They ended up in a concentration camp, death camp, and were killed. There's a close relationship between Japanese Americans and Holocaust survivors. We were both in concentration camps. Theirs was a death camp. Ours was not. This guy had his arm blown off. He has a submachine gun there. In Italy, he had his arm blown off. After the war, he's recovered enough to go back to Hawaii. He decides to get a haircut in Oakland. And he goes in the barber shop. And the barber takes one look at him. He's wearing his captain's uniform, medals, minus in one arm. And the barber said, we don't cut chap hair. Senator Daniel K. Inouye, Congressional Medal of Honor. I remember in Watsonville, I could read and I'd go down Main Street and that's store after store. No Japs, no Japs, no Japs. The Suda family couldn't get the hero son buried in the, this is from Los Angeles. He wrote a letter saying he wanted to be buried in his hometown of Fountain Valley. No Japs are allowed in the cemetery. General Stilwell came down to help the family get their hero son buried. The mother's here. She was offered the medal and she says, I don't want it. You take away a farm, you take away our home, you take away my son, you put us in a concentration camp, he's killed, and you want to give me a medal? No, thank you. The daughter accepted. There was a young captain who accompanied General Stilwell. The young captain of the United States Army said, the blood of Americans soaked on the beaches are of the same color. President Harry Truman wanted to thank the 442nd and gave them another presidential unit citation. It was raining and the staff said, Mr. President, you don't have to go up there, it's raining. He says, yes, I do. He thanked the 442nd, he said, you fought prejudice and you won. Keep up that fight. And what Japanese Americans do today is they fight against racial prejudice. Five weeks before the war, before the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, the United States Army was getting ready for the war against Japan. And in Hangar 640 at the Presidio of San Francisco, Japanese Americans were studying the Japanese language to be used as a weapon against the Japanese. They fought in every single campaign from the Aleutians to the end of the war. My two brothers were in the military intelligence service. They were really good at interrogating Japanese prisoners. We knew, we captured their documents and such, we knew what they were up to. We knew their strength, the chain of command and such. In every campaign, whether it's Burma or China or Okinawa. How would you like to be a, like a football coach? And you knew what the off, their offense was going to do, whether it was going to be a run or a pass. 
you knew you could defense against that. Well, we could defense against theirs. This could have happened in my family. Wataru, interrogated by Tsuyoshi and Tadashi. It didn't happen, but it could have. We're not unique. There were other families that had sons in both armies. The surrender took place on the battleship in Missouri. Japanese Americans helped write the surrender terms. Tom Sakamoto, okay, he was there helping to translate. Whenever you see a flag like this, you know it's Japanese Imperial Navy. My brother, one of them, stayed in Japan with the occupation and restoration of Japan. He married a Japanese girl. The rest of his life, he served in the United States military in Japan during the Korean War and Vietnam. Japanese American women also fought in the war. Many were great linguists, others were secretary, others were nurses. From Watsonville, we had over 200, 203 to be exact, who served in the United States military during World War II. We were given $25 and a train ticket home. But a lot of people had no home. Where are they going to go? What kind of a welcome are we going to get? Monterey was pretty good. Watsonville was okay. San Jose was pretty good. Salinas was not. Salinas, Hollister, didn't want us back at all. All kinds of signs. There was a petition to get, round us all up and send us back to Japan. Never to allow any Japanese in this country except for maybe business purpose. Stores would not sell to us. People would not rent to us or hire us. Mrs. Marshall went into the stores when she found out, bought groceries, and delivered them to us. Her husband was a doctor. He sent us medicine. You know, the Salinas Assembly Center at the uh, hospital, the Memorial Hospital, he delivered six Japanese American babies. Those are not Japanese American babies. Um, <laughs> but he delivered six. He sent us medicine in Canada. For the teachers, okay, their cousin was General George C. Marshall, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They had one son who didn't have to fight in this war. He volunteered twice, not only for the army, but to be a paratrooper. That's even more dangerous. He was shot and killed by the Japanese. He was machine gunned while he was in the air by the Japanese. But the Marshals could tell the difference between Japanese and Japanese Americans. A lot of people in this country still can't. The captain who said the blood of American Sotelo beaches are of the same color became president of the United States. Do you know who this is? Ronald Reagan. And he remembered. And the government of the United States apologized for what happened. And we got $20,000 tax free, those of us who are still alive. Out of the 120,000, the government of the United States assumed that 60,000 had died and 60,000 were still alive. Well, guess what? 80,000 of us were still alive. You know what that means? Sushi is good for you. We want you guys paying attention. Thank you. Thank you. But sushi is good for you. You know what's funny? One of my favorites is California roll. You know what's so funny about that? It's got avocado in it. <laughs> no avocados in Japan. Mike Pasoka, our leader during the war, wanted a memorial built in memory. And today we have a little park, National Japanese Memorial to Patriotism. These ladies were born in Japan. They could now become citizens of the United States. And they're singing their favorite song. What is their favorite song? God Bless America. What happened to us? Should never happen to anybody. Nobody 
should go to prison because of the way they look or how they dress. The work continues, you guys. You guys got to help. Okay? Discrimination in any form. When you see a person, what do you see? A human being. Listen, thank you so much. You've been a great audience. Appreciate it. My brother, the one that was um, educated in Japan, the draft doctor, okay, I didn't tell you this, okay, in 1938, my father died before I was three, and we took half of the ashes to Japan, okay? I'm three years old, I don't remember the trip, all right? My brother, who was six, admits he remembers partially, but my mother kept telling us, when we got back, that we were treated so badly by the Japanese militarists, okay, police, customs agents, because we had American passports. Heaven Mendoza to the attendance office. Heaven Mendoza to the attendance office. She wanted no part of the militarists of Japan. She couldn't be a citizen of the United States. But she certainly didn't want to support the in Japan to continue making war on China and the Philippines and such. Let me, let me before you guys go, okay. One girl in the third grader asked this question. Right? I'm teaching third graders this. And the girl asked, Mr. Ashimoto, in camp, did you have a girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the third graders think so differently, huh? What? You want, you want the answer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is how I responded. I said, you know, I was poor. You know how expensive girlfriends are? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.